Happy to announce uh, and introduce Nate Larson. Nate is Director of Remote Medical Sensing at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and one of uh, the founders and leaders in the Imagine Care team. Uh, Nate grew up in the Rocky Mountains and quite enjoys chocolate. And we share that in common, the, the chocolate love, not the Rocky Mountain heritage. Um, and we share a lot more in common. Uh, the first meeting we had with the Imagine Care team was like, it was so wonderful because what they're trying to achieve is completely aligned with our mission to improve health. And we were picking up what they were throwing down and vice versa and we're like, all right, let's do something amazing together. Uh, the revolution is here. Dartmouth Hitchcock is paving the way and I'm so excited to hear uh, from Nate right now. So please give Nate a warm welcome. Hello everybody, I'm Nate. I'm visiting from up north uh, in the uh, little hamlet of uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm representing a much larger team of Imagine Care at Dartmouth-Hitchcock who are here somewhere in a table. Uh, let me hear you guys. Hey, there we go. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with a little call and response to make you all very uncomfortable at the beginning here. Um, but really what I'm hoping to do today is to entice you to get out of the gates and to get started with your health experience design and with the, a lot of the wonderful things we've heard today to actually move forward and execute as opposed to continue to study and think about it. So the reason that I think that's so important is that it's 2016 and it's time to fire it up, Buttercup. So can I hear you say, fire it up, Buttercup? Fire it up, Buttercup. One more time, fire it up, Buttercup. Buttercup. That's why we're here today is to fire it up. So let's get a few things out of the way real quickly. We aren't special in healthcare. There's a myth that somehow we have different expectations from our customers in healthcare than we have in other industries. It's not true. Healthcare uh, has the same, customers have the same expectation from healthcare that they have in any other industry. In fact, uh, it's identical in most studies that you look at. Uh, we really are looking for people who want uh, to have value provided for them. They want to have the same expectations of customer service. And there's no change, really, as you move from industry to industry to healthcare. So we're not so special, really, after all. But there's still this kind of paralysis about wanting to change in healthcare. And a lot of us uh, still seem stuck in a current customer experience that uh, is tough to, to break through. In fact, I like to say that sometimes we're just sitting in the corner, blowing bubbles, hoping that the world will just kind of keep spinning around us. But the bubbles aren't the only thing that are about to get popped. And I've been told by a doctor at Dartmouth-Hitchcock to also remind you violence is not the answer <laughs> when I show this slide. But there's going to be a lot of health systems that are surprised who are currently not engaged in health experience design change and uh, some that don't exist anymore if they don't get engaged very quickly. So what do we need to do about that? Well, we need to drop a lot of the terminology, and we heard this already this morning, which is one of the handy things about coming after speaking so many smart people is I can kind of just say, re remember what you heard earlier this morning. Uh, telemedicine, telehealth, digital health, which we use quite broadly right now, are all terminologies that we really need to see disappear because we're really just talking about health and we're talking about health experience. Imagination is amazing because the ideas we accept as reality today seemed completely crazy not too long ago. So imagine this, creating a hospital that doesn't want people to visit. Not because we don't care, but because we do. Imagine a hospital that believes healthcare doesn't just mean treating sickness. It means caring about our patients enough to keep them from getting sick in the first place. Our journey to making possibility a reality starts with our imagination, and it leads to change. And those changes make us different because they help us make a difference. They show people the difference between healthcare and actually caring about health. And that caring about health is more than just an attitude. It's a way of doing things differently. It's clinics at local pharmacies to make checkups convenient and easy. It's connecting doctors and patients through telehealth right in your home. It's putting time and energy into improving the health of our communities personalizing care for each individual, and creating ways to pay for healthcare that are simple, flexible, and keep the process human. It's creating a system that rewards the quality of care instead of the volume of care. It's using smart technology to sense and respond to the needs of individuals proactively before they even know they need help. Imagination isn't unrealistic. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the clear recognition of possibility. 
and this possibility is real. We're creating a sustainable health system with one goal, to improve, in very real ways, the lives of the people and communities we serve for generations to come. Imagine what we can do together. And that's the vision of Dartmouth-Hitchcock and the, in the Imagine Care product and the Imagine Care uh, program plays one part in that. And our CEO, Jim Weinstein, has been very um, forward thinking and letting us exist in a health system. And you'll hear in a little bit because um, we kind of compete directly with ourselves with this product. So our team comes from a number of different backgrounds. The Imagine Care product was set up, project was set up with people from retail, hospitality, publishing, entertainment, all kinds of different industries that were brought into Dartmouth Hitchcock to get set up. And I think we're in a really unique position, however, though, in that we're not a technology company. We're not a device manufacturer. We're not a data harvesting business from a tech standpoint. We are a nonprofit health system that is creating a new product that is not geographically bound. And what's important about that is our core DNA at Dartmouth-Hitchcock is based on decades of population research, a treasure trove of data, both for population segmentation as well as from CMS. Uh, the latest in evidence-based care pathways from worldwide experts and subject matter experts, which uh, makes us very unique in a lot of ways in evidence-based medicine. And a true understanding that mental health and behavioral health are integrated into health. They are not separate. They do not need to be fragmented. They should be part of the total solution. They are health. So there's a lot of unique things that I think driving these out of health systems actually position you in a good place. So <laughs> we need you though, to be doing a lot of this with us. It doesn't just take one product, it's not gonna be one solution, it's not gonna be one platform. We all need to be working on trying to change the health experience for everybody. And you've heard some great talks this morning about how we all can play a part in that. Why do we think it's possible? Because all these things that have happened every time we've seen an industrial revolution or a mechanical revolution in an industry are also here at play for us now in healthcare. We've had population changes that are dramatic. There's a democratization of technology, as you just heard, that is unheard of before. And tools are accessible to us today that have never been accessible to us before at a certain price point that we, that we haven't seen before. And we're also, uh, we're also seeing population changes that, um, and new financial pressures that are really requiring this to happen, people asking more and more of the healthcare system. Pat Green and Julian. This is how Imagine Care got started. Hello, Jay. Hello, Jay. Now, Julian, I see you have your computer linked to the telephone line. Can you tell us how you did that? Yes, well, it's very simple, really. Um, the telephone is connected to the telephone network with a British Telecom plug, and I simply remove the telephone jack from the telecom socket and plug it into this box here, the modem. I then take another wire from the modem and plug it in where the telephone was. I can then this switch will probably on the be very familiar to most of you. This is how you get online go. now. Is a Rotary phone dial. To make. Extremely simple. This is 1984. I'm now the computer to answer me, and things are starting to happen. Things are starting to happen. Things are starting to happen. Too recently, you got any examples? Um, yes, um, I sent a message to my doctor asking for a repeat prescription, and um, he said he's left the prescription for me in the chemist. Right. Right. What is the very first thing they were trying to do with this computer system? They were trying to improve their health experience. And they were successful at it, too, because she could pick up her script down at the chemist. So it's been the use of technology has really been something that is not new to apply to health experience. But we need to apply it now in a way that we haven't ever been able to apply it before. Things are starting to happen. This is what Imagine Care is really today. So we've come a little bit since 1984 in the technology. 
But what we're still trying to do is accomplish the same thing, is to improve people's actual health experience. There's a lot of very simple things going on with Imagine Care, a lot of very consumer-centric choices that we've made that just are simple things that should be obvious to all of us. There's also some incredibly complex things going on with Imagine Care, especially around analytics, individualized care off of evidence-based care pathways, and a lot of other kind of deeper technology. Um, as we've completed our pilots and betas and now have moved into commercialization last month, these are some of the early responses we're getting from people. You know, and Imagine Care in its simplest description is a health experience platform. Um, we're setting out to really try to improve people's health experiences by keeping the humanism still involved in those as well, and that's an important part of, uh, you know, what we'll hear a little bit about in a couple slides here as well. This is Annie, who's one of our wonderful rock star RNs, working in our digital health center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Uh, and here's what we're really trying to do with Imagine Care. We're trying to uh, support the care teams more proactively with actionable intelligence. We're avoiding unnecessary PCP utilization. Even in our own system, we're actually competing against ourselves by saying there's a lot of unnecessary visits, there's a lot of unnecessary calls for people to come in. Oh, sorry, it says Imagine Care calling me. My apologies. Uh, yeah, I'm in the middle of a keynote. Uh, yeah. No, my blood pressure is high. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'll just take over while he's taking that call. Um, I guess he's not feeling too well. Uh, so hi, I'm Jamie. Uh, I'm an experienced designer. I've been working with, uh, I work at MadPal, and I've been working with Imagine Care since uh, about January of last year. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about this angle of humanism that Nate just mentioned. Um, so kind of one of the first things we tend to do when we help an organization design any sort of system uh, is stakeholder interviews, uh, talking to the business folks about uh, the problems we're trying to solve and just getting a lot of different perspectives. And you know, usually in a lot of organizations, things kind of look like this. There's not a lot of consensus. People have different ideas of, of what the problems are that they're trying to solve or, or what the solutions might look like. But not really in a Dartmouth-Hitchcock, there was this really weird, kind of creepy uh, collective consciousness. Uh, it, was, it was just really clear that they had so many, so much research and so many conversations had gone into this uh, leading up to the moment that we got involved. Um, and so talking to these folks, um, it was clear they were really embracing the future of healthcare, both in their culture and their business. Um, and that was driving this, the idea behind this service. Um, so some very clear themes emerged that continued to design our, guide our design process. Um, so the first was this idea of technology as an enabler rather than a destination. Uh, we heard things like, this is not a technology solution, it's a human solution enabled by technology to help people self-manage. Things like, we give you the tools and the capabilities so you feel you have the power to take control. And that we are a conduit between teams managing their care, individuals, and their goals. Um, we're supporting them in the manner that they want to be supported in. So people often talk about engagement with technology as a goal in these kinds of, of systems. And really, engagement is a means to an end. It's not a goal in and of itself. The ends are those outcomes of self-efficacy and self-management, um, these things that Dustin talked a little bit about earlier. Um, and some individuals will require less engagement with technology uh, to reach those outcomes. And Imagine Care respects that. They talk a lot about supporting people's autonomy, uh, minimizing the use of controlling language, and helping people feel cherished and cared for. They also um, design, design for behavior change is not about spitting data back at people. It's about the tone that you use with people and the way communication occurs. Um, so it's important to kind of build that into these motivational relationships. We tested a lot of facets with the of the Imagine Care service with customers, including types of messages people might receive and who they might receive them from. Uh, one example of this is a common situation. Uh, you might have just achieved a health or wellness goal and, and received some sort of feedback message. So message A is from the Imagine Care team. You've met your activity goal, great job. Message B is from Karen. Hi, this is Karen. You've been doing a fabulous job meeting your activity goals. Keep it up. Now I'm sure we've all experienced something like message A. These kinds of messages tend to be automated, effective at first in nudging us uh, towards changing our behavior, but 
they tend to lose effectiveness over time because we know there's no one on the other side of that message. The presence of a human face and name on these messages had a big impact on participants in testing. It was also about the tone of the message, the fact that it was friendly, more personable, not automated sounding. And that all gets back to this other major theme we heard from stakeholders, uh, was this idea of real personal, personal relationships. Uh, understanding people is more than just their health conditions, and building rapport, finding what works for them on an individual level. Whether you work the graveyard shift or nine to five, whether you like to text or talk, Imagine Care is there for you in the way that you prefer. Healthcare can be user-centric, we heard, you receive healthcare when and where you need it on your terms. The staff need context on the patient. It can't feel like an offshore call center. They have to feel like we know them. And every patient is different, one of the physicians said. So I adjust based on the patient. I communicate differently with my professor patients than my Harley riding gun loving machinists, but it's the same amount of science. It's not patronizing. It's very important as we integrate these personal facets of people's lives, not to make assumptions or stereotype. But having that level of detail when you're caring for people 24 seven can be so useful, just in understanding the context of their everyday lives, their interests, their motivations, and their barriers. It's not just about the diagnoses, the clinical alerts, or the vitals data. For example, Mary and Annie here, both have hypertension, it's been trending poorly. Um, but they have very different things going on in their lives. Uh, Mary's been going through a divorce. Uh, she's a little worried about the Bruins losing, getting out of the playoffs tonight. Um, and she's just, just not been feeling too great. Um, and Annie, on the other hand, is you know, really stressed out at work, um, but kind of really on the ball, traveling, but also a little bit depressed because she lost her cat recently, but she's starting to, to get through it. Um, so just, just imagine kind of how you might shift your interactions with these people, these women, these individuals, based on some of that knowledge. Building that kind of nuanced understanding of people, cultivating rapport and trust through conversation is something that only humans can do at this point. The machines just aren't there yet. We see it in movies, but they're just not. And even if they do ever get there, will they have that same level of an influence as a real person? Can a robot really make you feel cherished and cared for? Maybe, maybe not. Imagine care divides the labor smartly, letting machines do what machines are good at, and letting people do what people are good at. Speaking of humans, I, Nate's back, I think, so. Let's we'll hear for that slide going. transition. <laughs> So thanks, Jamie. It's great to work with Mad Pal on, on really making the vision of Imagine Care come to life. It's like the Academy Awards right here. To wrap it up, wrap it up. I understand. I'm working on it. Uh, so a couple things I just want to touch on real quick before we wrap up. If you really focus on consumer-centered design as opposed to clinician or workflow-centered design, you will create a consumer advocate. You'll, your product will become an advocate for the customer. If you focus on that clinician and workflow design, you're going to create a product that is an advocate for the clinicians and the workflows that exist in the current system. It sounds like a simple thing, but it's really a really important choice or fork in the road as I think you do product design for health experience. We're choosing an Imagine Care to be very consumer focused, which sometimes can create tension with the existing health experiences, especially if you're in a health system and this is what you're starting out of, which is kind of a topic in and of itself that we can talk about in the hallways. Um, so how does this tasty treat all come together? Well, if we, we know it's, a, it's not just about IoT, it's not just about wearables, it's not just about call centers or design. Everything has to come together to make something taste really, really good. And if one thing's off, you're going to have a bad taste in your mouth. As a room full of very talented designers, you can also make very pretty things. Imagine Care had a lot of wonderful ideas when we first started about what we thought the design experience should be. And through testing and listening to consumers, we realized they didn't need those things. They actually were design solutions looking for problems, which you've heard a little bit about this morning. So what we're really trying to do, it's, and in that case, it's kind of like you've made a decorative cake, and then you bite into it, and you've probably been to social events where that takes place, and you have a bad taste in your mouth again. The design awards you might win making these beautiful apps and products may not help customers either. 
I was also told again by a doctor, Dartmouth Hitchcock, that this is not healthy. So <clears throat> between the boxing glove and the cupcake, I'm going to have a review when I get back to work. So, um, so the, the last really, the big point is to say that, you know, when all those things do come together, when you do have the right design and the right focus and the right health experience, and you're thinking about it from end to end, you can make something that's really, really delectable and that's really, really going to help people. So I want to end today talking about culture. Um, and what I'll really just say is go buy Adam's book. He gave me 20 bucks backstage, so we're all good now. Adam, thank you. Um, Imagine Care Digital Health. Imagine Care Digital Health. Digital Health. I'm going to talk about some of the outcomes of the culture we've created at Imagine Care. My Little Pony figure is very big in our culture, uh, as does the Star Wars, as do the Seattle Seahawks, and the 12th Man Theory. So all of these things are kind of core components of Imagine Care culture. And that leads us to friendship is magic, the force is strong with you, and grit. So again, from a healthcare delivery standpoint, we're thinking of the total end-to-end -to -end experience. It's really important that your culture be understood as part of your product and part of your health experience. If you have a wonderful app and you have a culture that is mismatched with that, the health experience is broken for people. So we have a couple principles. We're not going to go into deep culture here. I'm just going to give you some highlights. Everybody talks about keeping it lean. It's a startup axiom. And I've learned with every startup axiom in other industries before this one that the opposite is always true. So you're going to hire too early. You're also going to hire too late. But it is really important to try to keep your team lean and to try to prove out these concepts with very small groups. Imagine Care started with a team of three people. And we also refer to that as Villas Pullum. Does anybody speak Latin? Cheap chicken. So that's our, our kind of guiding principle for keeping it lean, is, is, it, is it Villas Pullum. Uh, we also called our initial uh, betas My Little Phonies as well, just to keep people off our scent. Failure's not a permanent state. We love to say fail fast. That's great. But if you're in a department, you need your budget next month. So if you fail too many times too quickly, you're also going to be out of a job, and your department isn't going to exist anymore. We call that perfect pressure. There is a really good, perfect pressure that exists when you do not have unlimited capital. Or if you do and you're that lucky, you shouldn't act like it. You really need to understand what the tension is between why you're doing what you're doing and, and keep focused on the, the product that you're trying, the experience that you're trying to build. You need lovers and fighters. Culture fit is as important as the design elements, is as important of every other aspect of your health experience. So that interview process for who joins your team is a really vital component of your health experience design. And you know, don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. So distractions are everywhere, especially in this business. Every day, if you go on to pick a website or pick your favorite news feed, you're just the deluge of comments about wearables and IoT and new technologies and everything for everybody that we can do right now. Um, again, you got to keep focused on what you're trying to do with your health experience and the audience that you're trying to serve. So we love to talk about moonshots, although I pulled up a little graph because I was arguing with somebody about this. We talk about it a lot less than we used to. But moonshots are great. However, if we do this well, if we collectively can come together and make health experiences that are better for people, we're going to go beyond the moonshot. We're going to be hanging out on the moon. We're going to be doing a little dance on the moon. We're going to be partying on the moon. And that's what we're looking for with Imagine Care and designing new health experiences. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry I ran over, sir. And enjoy your coffee break. Thank you very much.